Hi everyone. Um, this is a very light, kind of fun presentation that I uh, of a topic that I picked um, a couple of years back, and um, it's just been a very interesting kind of journey going through it. Um, so, um, wh wh what I'm asking is, uh, who's Arabian Horse, and why is he such a beautiful stud? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take you through how I got to this topic, to be honest. And it's, it's, um, I've seen them all my life. They're all around Bahrain. Um, for those who don't know, I come from uh, Bahrain. And I usually, I live in a, um, kind of an older area of town. And I drive through some of the old ruins of uh, Dilman, which is called the Nakhil Highway. Um, and there's always riders. Across the board, there's always riders. Um, and that's kind of what got me intrigued. These horses walk funny, um, they look different, and I was always intrigued. So before we get into it, I'll just make the um, part presenter's promise. Um, I'm not an expert in the topic whatsoever. Um, I promised to, that I tried to learn as much as I could to satisfy my curiosity about the topic. Um, Someone here might know more than I do. Please let me know, correct me, and ask me questions, but do it so nicely. Um, I'm not trying to persuade you of any of my agenda or convince you of any action, take any action. Um, it's just to cultivate your own curiosity, hopefully. Um, it just kind of, I'll just tell you this um, presentation got me wanting to buy a horse, which I really cannot afford <laughs> by any means, uh, to be honest. So um, what makes the Arabian horse uh, so special? First of all, let's just go through the outline of what we're um, going to go to today. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about what our horse is and how old are they, characteristics of the breed of horses, different breeds. We're going to compare the Arabian to um, another horse called the thoroughbred. Uh, we're going to look at the history of the Arabians and the Arabs, uh, mainly the Bedouins and how did it make it to Europe, and some of the legends and fun facts about the Arabian. So section one, let's uh, understand a little bit more about horses and horse breeds. Um, so who are they? If we go to the next slide. Um, they're odd-toed mammals, which is, um, it, they've got five toes, but the, um, they're, and they're hoofed. Um, and they put pressure only on the third toe. The other toes kind of have no function. Um, the first horses to be domesticated are the Arabian and over 4,000 um, years old in the Arabian Peninsula. Contrary to popular belief, um, Mustangs are not really wild horses. Um, the only true wild horse exists in uh, Central Asia and are endangered. There's very little of them left. Let's look at the names and the different types of horses, males and females, and what they're called. A foal is a horse under a year old, regardless of the sex of the horse. Um, a filly is a young uh, female between the ages of two and three. Um, a mare is an adult female, usually four and above. A colt is a young male, uh, usually uncastrated, and a castrated horse is called a gelding and an adult horse above the age of five is called a, um, a stallion. These are also perfect names for hipster babies in Brooklyn, by the way. Just 100 percent. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, when I was doing some research uh, about these horses, a lot of scientific facts come, abroad, come on and male horses have more teeth than female horses. And it says this is one of the ways to identify a male horse from a female horse, like there is no other way, to be honest. It's just through the teeth. Um, let's look at breeds um, in the next slide. Just very briefly, there is nearly 300 horse, horse breeds in the world. Um, and they're divided into three different uh, categories, hot blood, hot blood uh, warm blood, and cold blood. Um, the next slide will show the hot blood horse. This is an... An example of a hot blood horse, this is called the Pentabian. It's a 99% Arab horse mixed with the Tobiani, which is the white spots. Um, so they're not, they're classified as hot 
cold and warm based on their temperament. The hot is more, um, is fast, is uh, very intelligent. They're good with speed. They're good racing horses. And they're usually slightly smaller than the other horses. It, it has nothing to do with their blood, right? Nothing to do with their blood whatsoever, no. They're not hot. They're not called hot-blooded or warm-blooded. They're hot blood, okay. which is the difference of why they're, it's not specific to the blood, it's the temperament. Okay. Um, cold blood horses, um, like this very beautiful Black Forest Chestnut, um, they are usually uh, slower horses. Um, they're good for just beauty shows. They're great with kids. Uh, they have a low temperament. They're very lazy. They're not the best kind of racing horse or working horse. They're usually kept around because of their beautiful um, physique and how they look like. Um, the warm horses is a mixed breed um, of cold and blood. And Andalusian is an uh, example of a warm blooded, warm blood horse, usually mistaken for it being Arabian if for people who are not necessarily familiar because they have a higher tail, slightly smaller face. But actually, the Andalusian is very uh, native to the, to the Spaniards, to Spain or Andalusia. Um, warm blooded are bred for specific purposes, whether it's for racing or for harvesting or for riding. So they mix these breeds to make sure that they produce, uh, and warm-blooded make up the largest amount of breeds under them. So that's just kind of a brief about horses in general. And now we look at the Arabian and who is she or he, just to be um, politically correct, I guess. So origins of the Arabian. The Arabian comes from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and they're the oldest breeds dating back 4,500 years ago. And they were bred by the Bedouins. Um, they moved later on towards the rest of the world and we'll kind of go through it uh, later and how that went into North Africa and went into Europe mainly. And then from Europe, how it went to the Americas. Um, they're the first domesticated um, animals and we look at the relationship with the Bedouins as well. In the next slide, I'll show you some of the differences in the physical characteristics of the Arabian horse. Um, the Arabian horse has a much larger uh, nostril, the uh, nostrils than other horses that allows flow of oxygen and air in the desert. Their jebha is much smaller, their heads are much smaller. They have smaller ears. What's really interesting is that they have um, curved necks, shorter backs, and higher tails. But that is because um, and their bone structure is completely different than any other horse in the world. Um, the Arabian horse has five less bones than any other horse in the world. So they have two, uh, pair of, uh, one pair of ribs less, making their backs shorter. They have one vertebra less in their... Um, sorry, four bones, uh, one vertebra less in their neck and one vertebra less in their tail, which may, gives them that smaller uh, physique. Now, one of the characteristics of having a shorter back is that it makes them really great for endurance. And they're one of the very few, very, very few horses in the world that can be ridden without a saddle for a very long period of time, and they're very comfortable to sit on. Um, so that's what makes these kind of physical characteristics, their smaller faces and their smaller bodies. I have a question. Um, is there yeah. a lot of variation in the, because there are these like three types? Yeah. Uh, is there a lot of variance in physical fe features for the Arabian or are they all pretty similar? Because there are so many breeds. So the, the very purebreds have um, similar characteristics of having maybe slightly longer neck, or slightly wider eyes. Um, also, by the way, just interestingly, uh, horses have the largest mammals, uh, hard, largest eyes in mammals on land. Oh. Um, pe um, people don't really know this because they think elephants might have the largest eyes, but actually um, horses do. Um, they differ in height, they differ in um, the size of their face and how uh, popped up their eyes are, but that's 
very rare because there aren't a lot of um, very pure breads left from the original five mares, which we'll go through um, later. They're, they're always, um, there's a mix of still pure Arabian, but of five different strands. Okay. Great. In the next slide, I'll compare the Arabian horse to the thoroughbred. So the thoroughbred is the most is the second most expensive horse in the world and most common. It's used um, mainly in the UK and the US. Uh, the thoroughbred is higher. Um, is, so they're, they're measured in hands um, and uh, they're measured from their shoulder, not their head. Uh, the Arabian horse, it's a 15.1, which is roughly 145, 47 versus the 155 or one. 60 sometimes for the thoroughbred. Um, the thoroughbred is much heavier. They were bred essentially for um, working fields um, and uh, carrying heavy load. Uh, they weigh about an average of 520 and can go up to 600. Uh, while the average Arabian horse is around 420, I think the lowest recording was 410 and the highest is 490 or 500. They don't go above 500. The thoroughbred was developed in the 17th and 18th century by English mares and mainly Arabian and Berber studs. So the mares are the females and the studs are the males. While the Arabian is much older. So the ancestral lineage or the heritage of the thoroughbred is actually Arabian. Um, and officially developed and signed as a new breed in 1791. Um, but the Arabian as pure bloodlines and being saved um, have, been doing, have been around for 2,500 um, years now. Um, sorry, 4,500 years. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll just show you a couple of pictures of what they look like. Are you not going to comment on measuring things in hands, Shuyani? <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> so weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's weird how they, ca they measure just the horses and hands, no other animals, from what I've uh, found. Oh. Uh, so the second slide is a thoroughbred. The, the, sorry, this slide is a thoroughbred. You can see um, it looks a little bit higher, a little bit larger than what, is, what you might see normally. This is an Arabian horse. Um, it's not literal hand. I see a message from uh, a question from Karen. It's just a measure. I don't know if it was somebody's specific hand that they took as a measure. Could be. I, I guess uh, measuring something in feet is not any less weird. I mean, yeah. all the time. Yeah. So hands is, I guess. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I don't know if it's in the Arab and the Khalij in general, uh, but in Bahrain, we measure things by the hand when it comes to fabric. Yeah. And, it's, it's, it's just a common practice here. So this is an Arabian. You can see the tail is higher, the neck is rounder, the head is much smaller, um, and they have a different posture than the rest of the horses. So cute. Um, the next slide just shows comparison next to humans to show how high they can be in terms of kind of eye level. Arabians are very different. Interesting fact about also the Arabian. Um, actually, we're going to go. We're going to go to that later. No worries. I'll just show you guys a quick video that um, I found um, really interesting about these Arabian riders. Um, usually ridden without saddles, and you can see here they're smaller. You can tell when the rider sits on the horse is much higher than the head. There are so many of these really interesting and funny videos of, um, I guess, mainly Saudis or maybe even Emiratis kind of riding their, uh, uh, their horses. Yeah. I don't know if there is the part where the guy is standing on the horse. Let's see. We have, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there's plenty of those around. Okay, so on to the next slide. Um, let's look at the relationship between the Arabs and the Arabian horse. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, or Mikey has mentioned also, there is specific strands of the Arabian um, pedigree, and there are five main horses. Now, legend has it that um, with the Prophet Muhammad, when he moved from Mecca to Medina with his uh, horses, he let go of these horses to find water. And when he called them, five main horses returned before finding water. Um, and these became the five mares that the Prophet really looked after and the bloodlines of the pure Arabian. And these are the Sagla Saglawi, Dahman, Khailan, Habdan, or Abiyan. Now, these names um, indicate something about them. So the Saglawi is the way it stands. It's a descriptive word. Dahman, Dahma is a color, which is a darker horse. Khailan had a feature of very um, long lashes and eyes like he's wearing uh, eyeliner. Hedban had a much smaller uh, snout and head. And Abyan was a lot darker in color, almost black. Um, the horses come in five main colors. Um, bay, brown, black, gray, and um, bay, brown, chestnut, black, and gray. There, yeah. So these um, horses, so contrary to popular belief, when you see a white Arabian, there's actually no white gene in the Arabian horse, uh, the Arabian horses. They're very light gray genes, but the white Arabian doesn't exist. Also, the Arabian has black skin, unlike any other horses, because that helped them survive in the desert. Um, and the recessive gene of the gray kind of diluted into almost white, but it's not actually registered as white. And usually when you see what looks like a very white Arabian is a mixed breed, which has a different category and is not classified as pure Arabian. We're going to look at how the Arabians or the Bedouins kept track of these uh, horses and their pedigree, which is very interesting because the Arabs didn't keep a written record. It was oral history. Um, so how did they keep their bloodlines pure? How did they know which horse came from which family or which farm or which stud farm? They're usually called, Arabian horses are usually have a kind of ism murakkab, two names. The first name, which is the rasan or, or the strain, um, is the origin and the Arabs um, take the name of the mare. So if there is a Saglawi mare then, and there is a Hejazi family that is raising these Saglawi females, their kid, her kids will be called Saglawi Hejazi. Hejazi is the marbat, is the substrain. The marbat usually means, or technically means in Arabic, where something is tied. So where do they come from? These horses are their forms. Um, so you have, for example, Khailan, Ajuz. Ajuz is a family, Beit al-Ajuz, or the al-Ajuz family, are the substrain, al-Marbad, and Khailan is the main strain. Now, when these breeds mix, they do keep their mare names. They don't take their sire names, their father's names. Um, so the bloodline always indicates who the mother is and not the father, because the, the, the Arabs believed that the mother carried the higher or the better gene always. So that's how they, distinct, uh, they distinguish them by name. But then every breed or every um, rasa and every strain had its own color of the dresses that they'd wear. And the stitches of the different colors indicates which marbat or which family and stud farm raised these horses. And that's how they kept them um, clear and, and understood how they bred and how they mix them together. For the longest time, the Bedouins refused to mix uh, the, uh, the strains and kept them pure, but later on started mixing between, for example, uh, Saglawi and Abiyan, Dehman and Khailan to create breeds that are specific to families because they wanted to stand out. And there are now around 23 strains 
um, have developed over the past 300 years in specific to be considered pure of these, um, uh, of these 23 substrains. The Arabs unfortunately only started documenting um, the, the bloodlines and pedigree certificates in the late 1800s, which means if it wasn't passed down from generation, it would be completely lost. I'm going to look at Egypt's role in um, can kind of really cultivating the Arabian horse and keeping the blood pure. Abbas Ali Pasha of Egypt was very interested in Arabian horses and had one of the largest stud farms. Um, he gave them away as gifts to many of his cousins and uncles and other uh, rulers around the region from the Ottomans and even the Europeans. Um, and kept a very a rigorous, he's the one that started documenting the Arabian bloodline and pedigree and certificates. Unfortunately, after he died, um, his son wasn't really interested in the Arabian horses, um, Ibrahim al-Hilmi Pasha, and he kind of neglected them, sold them for cheap, uh, the stud farm was misused and mishandled. Um, and then Ali Pasha was close to Abbas Pasha and used to buy from him. And then when uh, Ibrahim took over the stud farm, Ali Pasha tried his best to kind of acquire more and more horses and bought about 20, 40 of the purebreds from the um, uh, farm of Abbas specifically. Uh, Ali Pasha ended up going bankrupt uh, uh, and losing a lot of money and having to sell a lot of the horses. These stud farms kind of tried to keep up with um, keeping the horses running, but unfortunately they were being sold to um, Europeans um, to, keep, to keep the bloodlines pure. Um, Ali Pasha then... Um, and it gives the uh, horses to a bunch of the government officials in the times, and they develop a specific programs for breeding that are more popular now, like Sheikh Abayid and other farms. But Sheikh Abayid is the most popular one, and we're going to get to it when we talk about the Blunt in a bit. Uh, Bahrain also played in a very important role in keeping the Arabian horse, if we go to the next slide. Um, Sheikh Isa bin Ali, um, during his time, um, kept... Uh, okay, so why is Bahrain's role really important? Because the Al Khalifa of Bani Atba came into Bahrain in the late 1700s, and they came with their horses. Now, they're the only ones that came and bred horses in land versus the Portuguese and the English, which came, brought their horses and actually took them back. The... Um, Arabia, the, because of their Bedouin nature, they kept their Arabians intact. And because of Bahrain's nature of being an island, they were very controlling of what horses come inland and what breeds. So the Royal Stable Farms here has some of the most pure Arabian breads in the world currently. Um, if anybody ever visits, you can request and go see some of these horses. And they're absolutely beautiful. Um, Bahrain was in good relations with Egypt and um, was giving a lot of um, gifts as horses to uh, uh, Egypt's farms. So Sheikh Isa bin Ali um, gave uh, a very important mare that became a, a foundation horse for most of the horses now existing in the U.S. and uh, South America. Um, he gave it to uh, Abbas II in 1903. This horse was called Bint al-Bahrain. Uh, Bint al-Bahrain was not necessarily um, beautiful, if we go to the next slide. And we, I'll tell you more about her in uh, coming uh, slides. Um, she lived in Egypt for a couple of years. She didn't have any kids for a while. Um, and actually only, um, they say, issued one daughter, which is Delal. Um, 
So these, Bint al Bahim plays one of the most important roles in Dalal's history, obviously being her mother, but how this Arabian moved to South America and uh, the US through the UK. Um, if we look at um, the next slide and how these pedigrees are done, um, Egypt started recording in the 1800s, like I mentioned, and they recorded them when they was, were selling them off to, um, they were translating them when they were selling them off to um, English buyers mainly. Uh, I, I, there, there were talk, I, I've read a couple of articles about Swiss translations or French translations and German translations, but I could only find English. Uh, Bint al Bahain here, you can see where the red arrow is, is the mother of Delal. And like I said, the Bedouins cared more about how, the mother. So it's always the mother on top. The mother comes first before the sire, the dame before the sires. This is the birth certificate of Bint um, Bint Meysa al Zghira. Bint Meysa al Zghira sold on, or born on the 23rd of August in 1958. Her great great grandmother is Bint al Bahrain. Um, I'll, the next one is in Arabic, uh, just to show you the difference. The Arabic obviously is from right to left. Um, I couldn't find a Meysa's uh, certificate, but this is Nizam, born in 23. It's very interesting looking at these for me online, because, and when you read about them, they talk about them like they're humans, completely. They don't talk about them like they're horses. Um, so the next slide is how English recordings are done. Um, and the sire goes first. Um, if we look at the next slide, yeah. The sire goes, goes first. So here is Bint Mesa Lazghira, which we saw earlier, uh, translated by, by um, if an English, the official one. But this is how the English write their pedigree. The sire goes first. And at the very bottom right corner, we see Bint al Bahrain, where in Arabic she'll be on the top um, left. Um, so let's see at how they migrated across Europe and their importance role and how they moved towards uh, being a very expensive breed. Um, the Crusaders were the first to use the Arabian horses. Again, they're, they endure a lot. They can withstand cold weather and harsh weather. Um, they, can, you can, they can ride them for a very long time. And they were used as war horses. Uh, the Ottoman invaders later used about 300,000 horsemen um, in 1522 when they invaded Central Europe through the Balkans. From the 300,000 300, horsemen, when they first entered Hungary, um, a lot of them were captured in Ottoman raids and um, they were bred in Hungary. Um, when, they reached, when the Ottomans reached Vienna, even more were captured uh, by the Polish mainly. Um, so the, both the Polish and the Hungarians captured Arabians, fleeting and um, from the cavalry. Um, so in 1905, uh, this is just jumping a little bit to Hungary, um, Hungary had issued a, a decree that only a Bedouin major would look after the Arabian horses that they have, that they've captured from that bloodline from 1522 and 1529. Um, and he'd be the master of horses. So they always have a Bedouin living a fantastic life in Hungary, looking after horses. Um, breeding revolution started in the UK in 1683 by very different breeders. Um, and they were buying from mainly Hungary and um, Vienna at the time. Uh, they started breeding and keeping uh, Arabian horses, um, but not in terms of any purebred, they didn't understand them so much. But there was a breeding revolution and creating stud farms in specific. In 1722, the Imperial Russian stu uh, stud by Peter the Great was formed, and he was very also interested in buying Arabian horses. Catherine the Great had 
um, 12 pure Arabian horses, uh, 12 stallions and 10 mares that she kept in a separate stable, fed them different food, a much better quality because of the way they looked and the way they, um, uh, of their characteristics. Now, all of that is their first kind of, um, let's say, in, interest in the, with Europeans. And 1878 was the largest impact um, that the Arabian had in terms of breeding in Europe through the Crabbit Farm by Lady Anne Blunt. Now, if we go to the next slide, Lady Anne Blunt is a very, very, very interesting character. Uh, Lady Anne Blunt married, uh, Lady Anne Blunt's mother is Ada King, who is the first computer programmer. Um, she comes from a wealthy family. She married also a wealthy man, Wilfred. Um, it wasn't a very great marriage, but they traveled a lot. And they were very infatuated with the Arabian Peninsula. They were here a lot. Uh, Lydia and Blunt spoke five languages, French, German, English, Arabic, and Italian. Um, and she resided uh, for a time in Nejd, in Saudi Arabia. And her house and where she lived is still preserved. And I think now, I saw a video that came out a few months ago about preserving where, she's, where she stayed and uh, some of the Bedouins talking about her life from stories passed on from generations to generations. Um, so Lady Anne Blunt fell, with, fell in love with Arabian horses and started buying them and taking them back to the UK um, with her husband. She um, then kind of started moving and traveling in the Arabian Peninsula. And soon enough, she moved into Egypt, where she passed away and she was buried there in December of 1917, um, where Lady Anne Blunt saw fell in love with um, Bint al-Bahrain, bought her, escorted her personally to, um, uh, what's it called, to the UK, where she gave birth to Delal, and then Delal gave birth to almost 100 and, um, 114 different um, mares that became also foundations for horses in um, North America. So she spoke fluent um, Arabic. She was the first lady, she first European lady to cross the Arabian desert on a horse. Um, and... Uh, she resided with the Bedouins. She lived with them their own lives. So she created this um, stud farm in the UK, but she also helped. She was one of the seven founding members of the Sheikh Abayid farm for the Sheikh Abayid stud um, with, Ali Basha, with Abbas Basha II um, in Egypt. So these two farms are the most important farms in the history of the Arabian horse. Um, you, can, when you, you can go on YouTube and Google Crabbit Arabian. They almost have their own breed. Um, but she was very much into a specific strand, which is the Dehma Shahwaniya, which came from Bahrain. 90% um, now of the Arabian horses existing around the world have traces of crab bit breeding. So she really took that rigorous um, Arabian breeding and exported it to the world. She had a lot of trouble in the beginning forming the stud farm because when she was in the Arabian Peninsula or in Egypt, her caretakers there weren't necessarily looking after the horses. Now, Arabian horses, because of their hot blood temperament, they need constant training and constant attention. They're attention seekers um, because of the way the Bedouins have bred them. The Bedouins used to sleep with the Arabians in the tent. Um, they would keep their goats and their camels outside of the tent, but the horses would stay with them inside the tent because they were so precious. And scientists believe that's why Arabians have um, a very... A strong connection with humans, um, and they're very loyal. They're, they will they will charge and attack someone who they think is attacking their, uh, let's say, uh, master or their rider. 
But back to Lady Anne Blanche, she, um, very, very, very interesting character. I would highly suggest someone doing further research and kind of a presentation on her uh, separately. Another interesting fact is that um, she is considered one of, she had one of the most, she was one of the best preserved Stradivarius violins in the world that sold in an auction in Japan for 10 million pounds. Um, she played the violin. She was a very interesting character. So I definitely encourage um, you. Yeah. But then I have a question for you. Um, was her interest in this, or like the Arabian horses, was it purely an aesthetic interest or like a nostalgic interest? Or was it a, was there interest, like a strategic interest in this? It was no strategic an, an interest. She grew, up, I mean, she grew up with what, horses all her life. What was at the yeah. core of her interest? Yeah. They were just extremely beautiful. There are record diary, there are uh, diary records of her diary that says, she explains just how beautiful they are, but also their temperament, that they, she developed a very strong relationship with them. Um, her records of Bint al-Bahrain specifically was, initially she was going to buy Bint al-Bahrain another, another mare. She went for Bint al-Bahrain because she thought her personality was very exquisite. She was um, very playful. Um, she was very inquisitive. She built a connection with that horse. Now, um, all horses can build connections with humans, but the Arabians have a very special way of communicating with their um, kind of owners, let's say, or companions. I would rather say companions, actually. So she was very interested. She, aesthetically, she was very drawn to them, but then she fell in love with them because of their, um, their character. They were just very inquisitive and intelligent creatures. And she didn't want them to get lost, um, especially how they were handled in Egypt. And, sorry, the farms were kind of falling apart and she wanted to preserve. And I think she developed an interest as a kid. She's always had horses, but then she kept them pure by going, uh, just building studs for Arabian horses. Okay, so the legend. Um, I've, I've heard this a few, from a few people. I've read this in a couple of articles, but there are no kind of confirmed sources, but the legend of the unicorn comes from the Arabian horse. Um, the way it looks, the way it moves, uh, that's where it comes from. So I touched briefly on this. Um, El Khamsa, which are the prophets five mares are the foundation of the pure blood Arabian as we know them. Um, so of course, uh, the prophet and his, um, uh, let's say companions and the tribe and during wars had multiple horses, but these five mares were kept aside to breed um, excellent horses, whether stallions or mares to continue the bloodlines. Interestingly enough, I found very little writing about it in Arabic, but a lot more in English. Um, I've done for this research more, both Arabic and English, but have translated some of the stuff that I found. Um, so that's kind of the legend of uh, the Arabian and where it comes from. Um, in the la next slide, I'll tell you a couple of um, really interesting facts that I found. Um, they can't throw up. Uh, physically, they, are, they cannot throw up and they can't breathe through their mouths. Um, they, they can suffer from severe depression. Um, genetically, they're closest to rhinos than any other animal. Um, Napoleon rode uh, an Arabian, and his name was Marengo. His skeleton is in the um, War Museum in the UK at the moment. Like I mentioned, there is no white um, Arabian. It's just a very light gray gene. Um, and they're the most expensive horses in the world. So. Um, their prices are based on breeding horses or stallion horse stud horses, and the average a million. And if we go back to the thoroughbred, the average thoroughbred cost is about a quarter of a million dollars. So there's quite a large gap between the Arabian horse and any other horses. Um, and the next slide is just a video kind of outro to, um, to this presentation. These are um, crabbit uh, stallion, the crabbit horses. 
Um, you can tell the way they move were different. The Arabians all have this strut to them. They don't necessarily have to be trained. They're known as uh, dancers as well, um, the way they move. Um, they very, very quickly learn from their parents how to strut and gallop. I don't know if the video is streaming uh, clearly, but... And yeah, that's it for me. Um, a light uh, presentation, I hope, and nothing too um, exhausting. But I think there is a lot there for people who would like to kind of take it further. Lady Anne Blunt is a very interesting character. Uh, the stud farms in Egypt are uh, super interesting in how uh, they've played a role. Um, where the Arabian exists towards the other horses, so... Majority of the, uh, the horses around the world have Arabian blood in them now. And another interesting thing is that Arabian horses are pure bloods and have their own association. If they have 1% not Arabian, they're not considered pure bloods and have a different association for mixed blood Arabians. Um, so they're kind of, the pure Arabians are kind of the Malfoys of the... Hogwarts there. <laughs> yeah, they're the Slytherins. But this was so fun, Great. such a fun presentation. Um, I'm gonna, so everybody remember to put your questions in the chat um, and this way we can kind of get to them. I'll, I'll ask a question while people kind of continue to put their questions in. I, yeah. I noticed in the, when you were yeah, first yeah. kind of doing the comparison of the Arabian versus the regular horse, yeah. it looks like the eyes of the Arabian horse face a little bit more towards the front as opposed to like on the side, which is how in my head I usually imagine the horse. Is that a thing yes. also? Yes, they do. Because their jebha is thinner and their face is smaller, everything is more compact. Mm. But their vision is not different than um, other horses. Right. So they still see the same range as other horses. It's just the way that their eyes are placed. Oh, I think right. Osama has a question first, and uh, we'll go with Nuf. Well, his question was, um, are there any projects to keep his bloodline scientifically, like DNA identification? Yeah, there are so many. So they continue now to keep the DNA bloodline pure. Um, and they keep track records because um, horses also develop, certain breeds of horses develop certain um, medical conditions. And through kind of DNA tracing and tracking, they can either eliminate or look at not mixing certain horses together to ensure that they don't develop certain medical conditions. Uh, but there are... Uh, so many around the world. I, unfortunately, um, I think maybe being majority of us, maybe Arab here, but not to generalize, we're good at starting things, but not necessarily keeping them. So the biggest stud farms for Arabian horses now are in the US um, and UK and around the world, but not necessarily in the Arab world. It's like Egyptian cotton. Egyptian cotton is now grown in the US and actually not necessarily in Egypt. I think Nuf had a question as well. Hi guys, um, first thank you, so, thank you so much for this presentation. Honestly, I've heard more facts about horses than I've ever heard <laughs> in general. <laughs> um, but my question was, uh, I know you mentioned briefly about um, Prophet Muhammad and something related to horses. I just wanted yeah. to know if you had any more stories uh, that's related to horses and the Prophet. Um, only that he said, these five have to be taken care of. I didn't dive too much into the research about um, the prophet, but he really cared about his horses. So I know from my school studies, they were not allowed to be killed in war. There was no such thing said about camels. You could, if somebody is riding a camel in war times, take him down. But the horses were considered prized possessions and had to be taken care of. Um, but that's as far as I went in terms of research. I have four more questions. Aboud, uh, Camelia, Muhammad, and Rami. Eh? 
Yeah, sorry, uh, I, my microphone is not very good. I'm just wondering, I don't know if it's been mentioned, uh, the issue about WAHO, the World Health, uh, Horse Organization, uh, yeah. Arab Organization, I don't know if you mentioned it, and how they have a way to tattoo the, the, the certified horses on the neck. Uh, do yeah. you know, do you have anything to add on that? I, no, not really, because I didn't look into the um, uh, Arabian Horse Organization in terms of their practice. I was merely doing research about um, how they are in terms of characteristics. I know they chip some of them. I don't know about tattooing, but I will look into it actually. That's a very interesting point. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the use of these Arabian horses has changed over time in the Arab world. So for instance, it seems as though the way the Bedouins use the horses is a little bit different than the horses that are in the royal stables in Jordan. The Bedouins used the horses to cross longer distances looking for water because Arabians can go further distances in terms of endurance and they need less water when they're traveling. Um, they're now in, in, for example, in the royal farms in Bahrain, they're kept for, for aesthetic and wealth. And they do use them for endurance races here. Godolphin uses them for endurance, endurance races. And the royal stables in uh, the royal Hashemite stable, I think it's called, also sells them for endurance races. So when the Arabs use them specifically for crossing long distances in terms of moving, because the Bedouins looked for uh, obviously being nomadic, they moved from a place to another, and horses were the best means of transport. Muhammad, go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious if we can trace if the Arabian played a role. In, in terms of who the Spaniards brought over uh, when they started rediscovering North America and South America? Okay, so the Spaniards were very um, uh, proud of their Andalusian horse. So they brought the Andalusian first to North America and their conquest. And that was, the, that was used to um, mix breed in, initially. Um, but then the Arabian came in the 1800s by purchase of uh, the English mainly. Um, but there is one stallion, um, and I think I have his name somewhere, uh, the Mas'ud. Mas'ud from the Krabbit Arabian stud. Mas'ud has his own Wikipedia page. Um, he was the foundation stallion for a lot of the horses in uh, no, in North America and South America. Badr, thanks so much. Uh, Thank you, guys. Um, that was really, really fun. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Badr. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Bye-bye.